the eternal light. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light, a program which comes to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Our program today, Rosenblatt's Reply, was written by Mark Siegel and is presented in observance of Veterans Day. a soft-spoken fellow, tall, good-looking, quiet, serious. But most of all, friendly. I don't mean that boisterous kind of friendliness. I mean you could feel, if you knew him at all, that he was concerned about you, about what happened to you. I come from California, and he came from Omaha and later New York. He was a lawyer, and I'm an engineer. Our backgrounds were different. Our religions were different. Our basic interests were different. But he could have been my brother. That's what I felt about Herman Rosenblatt. And I think I know whereof I speak. We were shipmates in the Navy for three long years. Shipmates and brothers. The first time I ever even heard of Herman Rosenblatt, it was in a big way. We were on the USS Suwannee and we steamed into Bermuda to take on our fighter aircraft. It was in October of 1942. And though we didn't know it, we were on the way to the invasion of North Africa. I was officer of the deck that day, and I stood on the bridge next to our skipper, Captain Jocko Clark, as the planes came aboard. Now hear this. Now hear this. Clear the flight deck. Clear the flight deck. Prepare to land planes at 1320. Repeat. 1320. Officer of the deck. Yes, Captain Clark. Hand me my binoculars, will you? Yes, sir. I want to watch the planes approach. There's the first one now, sir. Well, she's coming in nicely. Good. A good landing. Here comes number two, sir. Yeah, there's something painted on his side, Ensign. Can you make it out? Not yet, sir. Oh, just a moment, sir. It says Rosenblatt's... Rosenblatt's reply. Rosenblatt's reply? Ensign. Yes, sir. Who is Rosenblatt? Do you know? I well, know, sir. I don't. Well, make it your business to find out. Aye, aye, sir. And when you do, send him to the bridge. <laughs> Rosenblatt's reply. I sent for Herman Rosenblatt and told him the skipper wanted to see him. Herman didn't waste any time getting to the bridge. Lieutenant J.G. Rosenblatt reporting is directed, sir. And he's lieutenant. Welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. I noticed the interesting name on your ship as you put down. Oh, it's not my plane, sir. You're not the pilot of Rosenblatt's reply, lieutenant? Oh, no, sir. I'm ACI of the squadron, sir. Air combat intelligence officer? Then why is the plane named for you? Well, the men who fly it named it Rosenblatt's reply. But why, lieutenant? I'm not sure, sir. Well, you must have some notion of why. Perhaps because... They know how I feel about the war, sir. And just how is that, Lieutenant? I want to see it won, sir. I want to see it fought until it's won. Enough so that the crew of that plane chooses to name it after you? It's only a guess, sir. Well, I guess you're guessing right, Rosenblatt. Glad to have you aboard. It happens that's the way I feel about the war myself. <laughs> Anyone who served under Jocko Clark knows how he felt about the war. 
The Fighting Indian, they called him. And for good reason. In all the time I was in the Navy, I never met a man who was as, a, as fixed on winning the war as the skipper. Except maybe Herman Rosenblatt. Sometimes in the cramped quarters I shared with Hermie, I wished he'd be a little less conscientious. I hope this lamp doesn't bother you, George. Oh, I love that lamp. It's a wonderful lamp. Why, I'd feel uncomfortable without that lamp shining in my eyes while I'm trying to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, George. I have to get these details down to where there's no possibility of error. You're a perfectionist, old top. An impossible perfectionist. Mm, perhaps. It, what I don't get is why. Some men join the Navy, but you, you eat, drink, and sleep the Navy. You'd think you were responsible for the whole flat top. I'm responsible for my squadron, George. Yeah, I know you are, Hermie, but... And I'm responsible for myself. Well, I wasn't really beefing, Hermie. I, I just... Oh, it's all right, George. I don't blame you. <laughs> You're right, I suppose. I am a perfectionist. And perfectionists are hard to live with. No, I didn't mean that, Hermie. All I'm asking is this. Couldn't you be a perfectionist in the daytime? All through Operation Torch, that was the invasion of North Africa, my insomniac shipmate worked at perfectionism night and day. We all knew that he'd done a good job, but no one knew it better than Captain Clark. By the time we got back to Norfolk, the skipper and Lieutenant Rosenblatt were good friends. Uh, Captain, can you spare a minute? Of course, Herman. Come on in. Sit down. Thanks, boss. What's on your mind, Herman? Well, you know how I feel about shore duty. I don't, Herman, but I can imagine how. Well, if the Suwannee's going to join Halsey in the South Pacific, I want to be on her. Herman, what are you talking about? Doctor, I'm afraid I may be ordered to shore duty in Washington. Well, what makes you think so? Mm, the grapevine. Oh, I see. Well, our sailing time's just a few hours from now, Herman. Do you expect your orders to arrive on board before then? They may, sir. The question is, what can I do about it? Well, if the orders come through, you'll have to carry them out. Uh, you know that. And if they don't? Well, then you go to the South Pacific, naturally. Thanks, boss. You've clarified the situation immeasurably. I have? Yeah, how do you mean that? I don't understand what's going on here, Herman, but there's no time to discuss it further. It's time to get the ship underway. We started the long voyage southward from Norfolk through the Panama Canal and out into the Pacific. It was at Noumea, New Caledonia, our first port of call in the South Pacific, that Captain Clark unraveled the minor mystery of his Norfolk conversation with Herman Rosenblatt. Anson! Yes, sir. I want to see Lieutenant Rosenblatt. And on the double! When Captain Clark said on the double, he meant it. Even Herman Rosenblatt was breathless when he reported in. Herman, do you know that your orders have been waiting for us here? Uh, yes, sir. The orders to Washington, D.C. you spoke about as we were leaving Norfolk. You're aware of that? Yes, sir. Now, you're also aware of the fact that these orders were dated the day before we left Norfolk? Uh, yes, sir. And by a curious coincidence, uh, you didn't receive them there? So that the Navy Department has had to trail you 7,000 miles into the Pacific? I know, Captain. Uh, the orders weren't decoded until after we sailed. You understand, Herman, that you will now have to proceed all the way back to Washington. Do I have to go, sir? Of course you have to go. Oh, couldn't you send the Navy Department a message suggesting that I remain attached here? Herman, you're a fine officer. You're the kind of man I'm proud to have serving under me. But there's a blind spot in your understanding of how the Navy works. Well, you could still intercede. I then. cannot intercede. Well, why not, boss? I can't run the Navy. I have enough to do to run my ship. But I'm sorry to see you go. No sorrier than I am, sir. It's um, been a great experience to serve with you, sir. Well, that goes two ways, Herman. There's just one little matter to be settled before you go. What's that, Captain? Well, you'll see in a moment. Orderly. Sir? Stand in the communications officer. Aye, aye, sir. Oh, Mr. Johnson. Oh, yes, Wilson. The captain wants to see you. Oh, thanks. Mr. Johnson? Yes, sir. I've just checked my dispatch file regarding Mr. Rosenblatt's orders. This dispatch should have been decoded before we left Norfolk. And Mr. Rosenblatt should have been detached. I'm sorry, sir. Someone in ship's communication slipped up. I know someone slipped up. I'm asking for an explanation. Yes, sir. 
The explanation could be that Mr. Rosenblatt has a good many friends among the communicators. Perhaps one of them knew how miserable he'd be at shore duty, sir. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that seems to be the general knowledge on this ship. All right, Mr. Johnson, you're dismissed. Sorry, sir. Forget it. It's water under the bridge. Thank you, sir. Airman? Oh, yes, sir. I admire your capacity for making friends. Thanks, boss. But sometimes I wish you didn't do so well at it. It'd make running the Swanee a lot simpler. Herman Rosenblatt was still preparing to leave, reluctantly, for shore duty in Washington when a message came through for Captain Clark. It's a top priority message, Herman. Directed to Captain Clark? Yes. Top priority, secret, immediate. Uh, I'll take it into it myself then, Bob. Right. By the way, Herman. What is it? Well, if I had any say about this message, I'd give it the same treatment we gave your orders at Norfolk. You mean you'd delay decoding it? That's right. Wait a minute. You can't make an everyday practice of that. You know, once was bad enough. Well, I'd still do it again. That is, if I could. But why? You'll see, Mr. Rosenblatt. You'll see soon enough. Message for you, Captain. Well, what does it say, Herman? Oh, I haven't read it, boss. It's directed to you personally. Well, let me have it. <laughs> Herman, I told you I didn't run the Navy. Well, yes, I I remember, sir. Only the ship. No, not even the Swanee, very shortly. I don't understand, sir. I'm being reassigned, Herman. You're not the only one to go back to Washington. <laughs> Herman left first and was assigned as aide to Admiral R.E. Davison, assistant chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics. A few months later, Captain Clark, temporarily returned to Washington, sat across the dinner table from his young friend. Well, Herman, I've got my new assignment. Are you able to tell me what it is, boss? It's no secret, Herman. I'm to command CV-10. CV-10? Oh, that's the new, uh, Yorktown. That's it. When's she going to be commissioned? Well, not for several weeks yet. Gee, the Yorktown. I give an eye tooth to be with you on that one, sir. <laughs> You've made that abundantly clear, Herman. Yeah, I know I have. Uh, look, sir, I, I know I shouldn't ask again, but... It, isn't there some way you can get to sea duty? That's it, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. I'm doing a job in the Bureau, and it's an important job, I suppose, but... Yeah, but you think someone else could do it? You'd rather be on board ship where you think you can contribute more directly to the winning of the war. I'm sorry, boss. I didn't mean to go over all this again with you. Oh, that's all right, Herman. But, sir, I still think that someone who wants to fight should be given the chance. That's what I told Admiral Davison this afternoon. What? That's what I told him, and he agrees. He's releasing you so you can serve with me on the Yorktown. <laughs> Jocko Clark's suggestion, Herman went up to Quonset, Rhode Island the very next day for an advanced course in air combat intelligence. And when the Yorktown was commissioned several weeks later, he was aboard as assistant ACI. I was aboard, too, along with several former officers of the Suwannee. In wartime, when a man is cut off from his friends, his family, his everyday relationships, an old shipmate becomes a brother. That was true for all of us who served together. But it was more than true, perhaps, for me and... Herman Rosenblatt. Hey, George. Hey, this is great. How are you? Oh, fine, Herman. And you? Never better. And I love this flat top already. <laughs> You're flat top happy. That's your trouble. Oh, no, not exactly. But I'm glad to be aboard. Uh, I think we've been assigned quarters together. Or at least I'm trying to arrange it. <laughs> You're willing to have a lamp shining in your face all night again? Willing? <laughs> Herman, I've missed that light ever since you left the Swanee. It'll be a pleasure. When you tell about the war, when you look back, when you tell the stories, it's the pleasant part you talk about. Ask any Navy man. You remember the long, slow days at sea, the bull sessions, the practical jokes. But the other part, the business of war. 
Maybe it's a tribute to man's spirit that he'd rather not recall the grim part. But this is Herman Rosenblatt's story, and fighting itself is part of that story. The Yorktown was the second of the new carriers to reach the Pacific. Our first combat action was a raid on Marcus. Herman was everywhere on the ship during that raid. And when it was over, while the rest of us relaxed, drained, spent, he began the careful documentation of the Marcus raid. It was hours later that he completed his report. Well, that's it. I better run it up to the old man so he can check it first thing in the morning. You don't look very happy about it, Herman. Well, who can be happy about a battle report, George? When you come out of it alive? Everybody. You're alive. I'm alive. A lot of other men aren't. That's true. But our casualties were very light, Herman. You told me so yourself. Our casualties? Yeah. Yeah, very light. Don't tell me you're worrying about the Jap casualties. I'm not worrying about them, George, but I can't say I'm glad to see men die. Do you know what kind of destruction we inflicted on Marcus? Eighty-five percent. Eighty-five percent of that island ruined and charred and shell hole. And if you'd had your way, it would have been a hundred. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I can't be happy about it. You're a strange guy, Herman. How do you hold the two things together? What two things? Being the fightingest man and the softest-hearted man in the Navy. Get out of here. I don't think I'm either. Well, you sure come close. But how you got there, I don't know. Early training, maybe. What do you mean, Herman? No, I told you how I used to ride around with my father when I was a kid. On the coal wagon in Omaha about a million times. Yeah, but I don't know if I ever told you that my father used to tell me stories while we drove around. Mainly stories from the Bible and the Talmud. No, you haven't talked about that. Well... All this while, I've been writing this raid report. I've been thinking about one of those stories, George. Maybe if I tell it to you, you'll see what I mean. Sure. It's a story about the time God drowned the Egyptians who were chasing Moses and the children of Israel in the Red Sea. I know the story, Herman. Well, perhaps not this part of it, George. When the Egyptians were destroyed, the story goes, a chorus of angels began to chant hallelujahs. As well they might. That's what I thought. When I was a kid, too. But I can remember my father telling me the end of the story. God heard the angels and silenced them. My handiwork is perishing in the sea, he said. How dare you sing in rejoicing? George, I've been thinking about that story the whole while I've been writing this report. The raid on Marcus was only the beginning. The names are only distant memories now. But for those of us who fought in those engagements, for men like Herman Rosenblatt, each place name was a trial, a test, a challenge of men's faith in freedom. <laughs> Wake Island. The capture of Tarawa and the Gilberts. Kwajalein. The capture of the Marshall Islands. Truck. changed ships, Herman Rosenblatt and I, and Captain Clark, who had become an admiral. But the pattern was the same. The lull and then the battle. Hard work and danger and relief at having survived. And through it all, if you looked for the meaning of it all, you could find a clue in Herman Rosenblatt, who dealt, like all of us, in death, but never forgot the value and the sanctity of life. Come in. Oh, good morning, Herman. Morning, boss. Herman, I've intended to tell you, but I haven't had the chance. Those operations orders on the truck affair. 
Well, they were near perfect. Well, thank you, sir. You might like to know that uh, Mitchell agrees with me. I sure do. But uh, there's something else I'd like to talk to you about, sir. Then go right ahead. I think it's at least as important as the truck operations orders. Well, that would have to be mighty important, Herman. What have you got? A plan, boss. For what? For rescuing pilots who were downed. You would? Uh, it's all here. I've written it all up. You worked this out all by yourself? Well, not by myself, Admiral, but with a few other officers. It's a coordinated operation using seaplanes, cruisers, and submarines. And it's all written up? This air sea rescue plan? Yes, sir. We'll have a look at it, sir. Of course I'll have a look at it. But what I'd really like to know, Herman, is when did you find the time to work on this? Well, in between times, sir. In between times? Yes, sir. A way of saving pilots' lives, eh? Yes, sir. Herman, I know that your civilian profession is the law. That's right, boss. But sometimes I wonder if you missed your calling. Every once in a while, I think you should have been a rabbi. Herman's plan, which consisted of using seaplanes to pick up downed airmen at truck and ferry them to a submarine awaiting outside the reef, saved many airmen. Not only there, in many places, because it was generally used from that time on. That was the one he got the Legion of Merit for. I could tell you about the decorations, too. The Silver Star, the Air Medal, the special citations, the commendations. But those were the outside signs. The little colored ribbons and bits of metal that stood for gallantry and heroism and devotion to duty. And I don't really have to mention them at all. If you knew Herman, if you lived with him, you didn't need to see the medals to know what kind of man he was. In September of 1945, when Japan surrendered, Herman Rosenblatt asked to be returned to civilian life with as much eagerness as he had joined the Navy some four years before. I saw him for the last time at Corpus Christi, where both of us were waiting to be mustered out of active duty. Well, George, I guess this is it. Huh? Seems so, Herman. You'll be going back to California, huh? That's right. You to Omaha? Oh, no, uh, New York. I grew up in Omaha with my practices in New York. That's a long way from California. Well, not for friends, George. I'll make it my business to get out your way. I hope so, Herman. When you do, you'll be sure to look me up. <laughs> We'll find some of the other fellows, too, and have a West Coast reunion, huh? Yeah, sure. What's the matter, Herman? You sound as if you haven't heard a word I've been saying. Uh, oh, um... George, I was thinking about some of the fellows who won't be able to attend a reunion. You're right. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, George. The truth is that whenever we get together, they'll all be there. Every one of them. Whole ship's company. The living. And those who go on living. In our hearts. I think of Herman, I always find myself remembering the fighter plane that carried his name. Rosenblatt's reply. Maybe it's because Herman was a man who, believing in brotherhood, really practiced it. Brotherhood and a responsibility toward others. That was really Rosenblatt's reply. Herman Rosenblatt's reply to life. Perhaps you wonder why I tell you this. You see, I never saw him again. Herman Rosenblatt died in 1949. But there's not a man who served with him who doesn't remember him as a brother. Ask Admiral Clark. Ask any of his one-time fellow officers. Ask me. If you would like a copy of today's script, please send your name and address with 10 cents to cover the cost of postage and handling to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, 
3080 Broadway, New York, 27, New York. And now we take great pleasure in presenting Admiral J.J. Clark, United States Navy, retired of New York City. Herman Rosenblatt was on his staff in World War II. Admiral Clark. The broadcast you have just heard portrays the record of one of many young men who were dedicated to the service of their country and to the cause of freedom. Especially Lieutenant Commander Herman S. Rosenblatt loved the Navy and the sea. He was happiest when his ship was underway for operations against the enemy. He was determined to win his part of World War II in the quickest possible time. He worked unceasingly and with untiring energy to that end. On many occasions when operation plans had to be drafted in a hurry, he would work all night. And the plans which he turned out served often as a model to other task group staffs to follow in the preparation of their own. He was ever mindful of others, and in particular, he contributed materially to the rescuing of downed airmen. Through his initiative in combat, many lives were saved. He had a keen perception which enabled him to take advantage of new tactical situations. As a result of this accurate interpretation of vital intelligence material and formulations of plans, an entire Japanese convoy was sunk. On this occasion, he was awarded the Silver Star for conspicuous gallantry. On another occasion, he was awarded the Legion of Merit for exceptionally meritorious conduct in battle. He voluntarily participated in numerous flights over enemy territory and for his contribution to the success of aircraft carrier operations against the enemy, he was presented the Air Medal. Not only did he participate actively in 11 naval engagements in World War II, but all three of the ships on which he served, the Swanee, the Yorktown, and the Hornet, were given presidential unit citations. It is fitting and right that on Veterans Day we memorialize and pay tribute to the many men and women who rendered distinguished service to the United States in wartime and who are no longer with us on Earth. Lieutenant Commander Rosenblatt was one of these. On another Veterans Day, 11 November 1949, a memorial service for him was conducted on board the aircraft carrier USS Midway while underway upon the sea he loved so well. Thank you, Admiral Clark. drama today, Rosenblatt's Reply, was written by Mark Siegel and was presented in observance of Veterans Day. Cantor David Putterman sang the liturgical introduction. Featured in the cast were Leon Janney, Norman Rose, Raymond Bramley, Robert Hastings, and Charles Olson. This weekly program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America and is directed by Daniel Sutter. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.